welcome. You're listening to the 1P versus 2P podcast. I'm Taylor Ray with my co-host and brother, Ryan Ray. Yes, Taylor, it's that time of the year again. Time to argue about video games of the year. Yep, just like every other major gaming site, major gaming podcast out there, we are going to be talking about Game of the Year, Game of the Year deliberations over the next couple of episodes. We're going to start off first with our special awards or honors categories, and we're going to follow them up with our top 10 editor's choice picks and, of course, our consensus overall Game of the Year for 2017. We're doing this a little bit differently than what we've done over the past two years on our site. And, of course, if you want to check out our previous award winners, just go to our site, 1pvs2p.com. We'll also link to it in the show notes to read all about our picks from the past two years. But let's get started. Let's recap the categories for this year, including some of the changes. Ryan, go ahead. Yes. So this year, our categories are best surprise, best looking game slash visual style, biggest disappointment, best mobile or handheld game, best new character, best gameplay moment, best music, biggest, most important news story, and finally, worst trend. Uh, if you've noticed, we uh, got rid of a category this year. This year, we eliminated best guilty pleasure. We feel that that category uh, is not as relevant. Video games are often a guilty pleasure for many people. Uh, but in this place, we've decided to instead squabble about best music because there's been a lot of excellent, excellent soundtracks this year that uh, we, wa- of course, want to bring our full deliberations to. So uh, let's let's get started with these deliberations, shall we? Yeah, but also I want to say a disclaimer up at the top is that we will be talking about a lot of the games released this year. Of course, there may be some spoilers. So just want to put that out there. If you hear about us mention nominated game when we talk about that in a specific category, you may want to skip ahead. Uh, Of course, we are going to give spoilers in the moment. So if we're about to talk about something story-wise that you may not have gone through or completed, we'll make sure to call that out. So you may want to skip ahead 30 seconds after we say, spoiler alert. All right? So just putting that out there. We've gotten some complaints about that in the past. (laughs) All right. Well, let's start Let's with that caveat. Let's start off with the first category, Best Surprise. This category generally describes games that we thought were a nice surprise uh, under our gaming Christmas tree. Uh, a lot of really, really surprising titles that f- seemingly came out of nowhere. So this category is a combination uh, both of expectations and also the quality of the, the games in this category. So the candidates for this category are Gwent, The Witcher Card Game, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, otherwise known as PUBG, Snake Pass, Everything, Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle, Neo, Golf Story, Battle Chef Brigade, and Endless Space 2. All right, Taylor, let's start talking about some of these games on this list. I put Gwent the Witcher card game on here, and I've talked about how I didn't actually like this game as a side game in in The Witcher 3, uh, The Wild Hunt, but I have to say they've made a, a lot of great improvements, but I am always, always nervous and leery about including games still in beta when it comes to Game of the Year deliberations, all right? I don't think it's fully released, so I'm going to go ahead and eliminate that. But I highly encourage people to go check that out, especially if you're into CCGs, for sure. Uh, to be honest, I'm not even sh- don't. E- I remember a lot of pre-release hype for that game, and then I'm not even sure when it entered early access. I remember there was like an early beta period, and I I am unclear about that game's release or final state or current state actually. So uh, I I agree. We should probably cut this off this list if it's kind of unclear. It's pretty polished. Uh, the only thing I will say about it, and then let's move on, is that they have not only introduced multiplayer play right online stuff but the single player challenges are really really fun let you un- uh, unlock cards without having to pay real money uh to get booster packs and that i think i i really have to recognize gwent for doing that I, I there are a lot of ccg games out there that don't do it very well i'm looking at you hearthstone the single player content in there is just not that great not it doesn't keep me going back so uh let's move on I feel like this game is really kind of a, or excuse me, this category is kind of a toss up between PUBG, 
huge, huge game this year. PUBG definitely has to be one of the three games on this list. Uh, it totally took everybody by surprise when it came out. Uh, you know, it's still an early access as of this recording. Uh, you know, a 1.0 release is currently targeted for December 20th, I believe. They finally put out a console version of that game. But it, this was absolutely like summer game of the year. Uh, absolute out of nowhere based off of the uh, Japanese movie Battle Royale, uh, multi massively multiplayer game, very tense, incredible, incredible out of nowhere thing. It just it, it felt like people were talking about this game from when it first got announced to people playing it. People are talking about this game in, in ways like that people don't talk when they talk about patches for this game. They're talking about adding like pretty basic things like vaulting fences and jumping and like a new map and it everybody's treating it like it's the biggest news in the whole wide world and uh PUBG is absolutely deserving of of one of the better surprises this year i think it has to be up there i would go ahead and say that it's genuinely the best surprise I, i'm comfortable with awarding it right away but we do have to like all the rest of the categories we do have to pick uh the winner and then two runners up so i think it's PUBG is a solid lock to win this category, but we do have to pick the two runners up. Not as important, but I feel like for me personally, I think it's between Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle and Golf Story. I think you're going to fight with me on Golf Story, aren't you? Yeah, well, Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle, the con- let's have that conversation first because I think that definitely needs to be one of the three. Um, <laughs> so that game was announced and everyone kind of rolled their eyes when they first saw the rabbits. It's like, oh great, these things again. It's going to be another mini game collection from Ubisoft, probably looking to cash in on the release of the Switch. And then you find out that Mario is in it. It's a crossover game. And then everyone's like, oh my God, they're going to combine Mario and Rabbids. Nintendo's letting this happen. Why is this happening? And then we remember fi- those leaks. Yeah. Right. And then we find out that it's an XCOM game for kids. And all of a sudden the conversation around that game was just like, Oh my God, they're going to give Mario a gun. Oh my God, th- <laughs> this game might actually be kind of good. Uh, it's genuinely good. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then like, oh my God, Grant Kirkhope is doing the soundtrack, the guy who made Banjo Kazooie music. And it's just like, oh my God, they're really doing this. Incre- Nintendo, what is Nintendo doing with their IP? Wow, 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 wow. So I think it definitely belongs on this list as best, uh, one of the better surprises this year. It, it, again, like one two punch completely out of nowhere and uh knocked a lot of people off their feet about surprisingly how good it is. So I think it deserves to be one of the candidates. Absolutely. Really a surprise out of nowhere. I mean it's it's a genuinely great strategy game and we can talk about that later when we talk about our editor's choice picks and, and our overall game of the year. But for now, yeah, I, I, I'm very comfortable having it as a runner up. Now for me, I, let me let me hype up golf story for a little bit. This is an independent game that was released uh, exclusively for the Switch. Think of it like Mario Golf meets Earthbound, okay? So it's some great 16-bit sort of art style mixed with classic Mario Golf gameplay. I would say it's closest to the uh, Game Boy Color version of Mario Golf. Since then, you know, that you've had a release on GameCube and on N64. So it's been a while. The Mario sports franchises, right, are very popular overall. But I... I'm strangely a huge fan of the Mario Golf style, and Golf Story does an excellent, excellent job reviving that. And I just think the RPG elements that they add to it, there are very clever mini games baked into it. You're not just playing 18 holes of golf with, you know, a timing meter, right? Very traditional uh, golf gameplay there. But uh, in between those, you 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 read some really funny dialogue, some really charming set pieces. Uh, there's, it's just very, very lighthearted and fun overall. And for a, a budget game, I think it's only $20 on the eShop, if I recall correctly. I, I think it's, it's well worth your time. I thought it was a wonderful surprise because there was not much marketing behind it, but there was a lot of hype I saw online about it. a lot of people tweeting about golf stories specifically. I have a question because when you added this game to this list, uh, you kind of told me uh, in a side conversation that the the last few hours, the last few levels of Golf Story kind of are where the game falls apart a little bit. Uh, do you still feel that way? Or do you feel like the whole of Golf Story is good enough to recommend to somebody else who's never, who might not be as familiar with Mario Golf or, you know, those those that style of like sports RPG? The difficulty spikes tremendously in the last couple of hours. And I think a lot of people would struggle with it. I struggled with it a tiny bit, but because of I have a ton of experience with these golf games, it didn't affect me so much. 
but I still wouldn't disqualify it from best surprise of this year because nobody had heard about this. Nobody had talked about this as an indie game released exclusively on the eShop for the Switch. Uh, I still feel like it, it deserves to be uh, one of the runners up, but I understand that Battle Chef Brigade because I'm anxious to hear about it. I haven't played it. I haven't played that at all. I know that was released on the Switch and PC so far. Correct. correct? Uh, you know, actually, the game that I would fight for on this list to be the other candidate is not Battleship Brigade, but I'll tell you a little bit about. I think Battleship Brigade is on this list because honestly, the concept is so novel that it it it's worth just mentioning in passing. Uh, basically, Battleship Brigade is a match three game combined with uh like some monster hunting elements combined with like the Iron Chef competition, if, if you like like cooking competition shows, it's a really neat send up of like match three mechanics, uh, games like Puzzle Quest, games like it honestly reminds me a lot of the inventiveness of Henry Hatsworth that uh like, oh yeah that match DS. three uh, DS game that was also a platformer. Uh, it, it, it's really innovative. I think it has some great ideas. It's a Kickstarter game. Uh, not all of the ideas from the Kickstarter made it into the final release, and there are some parts of the that game i think that kind of fall apart for me uh the animations are a little stilted uh the story is kind of has some weird pacing issues you know once you complete the single player campaign there's like a daily cook-off challenge thing and but there's no like versus mode the puzzle modes are very limited and once you once you complete the very short campaign there's not much else there i think it's a very like neat conceptual thing and that they hope that th- i hope that they make a sequel on uh, a very good like debut, but I wouldn't categorize it as the best surprise this year, or even one of the three. So, what's the other one that you're thinking? Of? I think I would make a strong case for Neo. Uh, Neo is the mm. Dark Souls alike game from the team that brought you Ninja Gaiden. Uh, a kind of out of nowhere. <laughs> uh, imagine a Dark Souls game if Dark Souls games con- didn't have like so much deliberate action. Like, imagine a world in which Koei Tecmo and Team Ninja basically got to continue making Ninja Gaiden games and eventually that spawned off into like Dark Souls like games like Dark Souls isn't popular it it never becomes a thing and instead like you know Ninja Gaiden eventually goes in this direction and that's basically what you have with Neo you have a Dark Souls game set in feudal Japan American protagonist uh who is loosely based on real history uh it it just controls so well uh unlike the Souls games you know, it really encourages a lot of different weapon types that you can use. Loot drops constantly. This game is really in this category because the game controls so well and it looks so good. It it copies a lot of the same concepts of Dark Souls, which I think for me is a knock against it. Uh, you know, bot the concept of checkpoints that you set for yourself are basically you know in this game just like bonfires are in Dark Souls. Uh, there are big boss battles. The game is designed to be very difficult, so it will kill you. But imagine a Dark Souls game. That where the action feels much, much tighter. And that's what you have with Neo. Okay, I mean, I could see that argument. The only thing I would push back on with it being a best surprise is that it was heavily promoted uh, at, I think, the PlayStation Experience and E3 shown off in the reveal trailers. That's right. Yeah, but I mean, still, though, people are like, oh, it's it's another Dark Souls or, or From Software's Bloodborne. But even still, the the how good it was was I think surprising. Is that is that what I'm hearing? That's that's what you're hearing. I don't think it's a surprise that it really like again. It, we had a lot of trailers for that game. I think it was a surprise that it actually turned out to be good and not just another like there are a bajillion Dark Souls clones out. There are a few this year actually that are not on this list. But of them, Neo stands like a, far and apart. I would say even Neo stands apart from Bloodborne. Uh, like I I think Neo is a is fundamentally a better game than Bloodborne, and that 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 might be sacrilege, but uh, I think for that reason alone, I think it deserves to be in the conversation. So I think this is between Neo and Golf Story. Uh, the rest of these games, while surprising, I don't think are gonna make this cut. So I think we can say safely say goodbye to Snake Pass. Uh, cool looking game, cool concept, uh, controls surprisingly well, but ultimately kind of boring. Uh, everything kind of too conceptual, too much of like, I would say an art project. Oh yeah. A, a, yeah. a really neat, <laughs> a really neat art project to be fair. But, uh, if it was more like Katamari, it would, it would deserve to be in the conversation and it's less like that and more like a radio play. Uh, we've already talked about Battleship Brigade. Endless Space 2 is, uh, 
a better sequel to Endless Space. This is a 4X game in the style of civilization, except you're in space and a lot of cool alien races and stuff, but uh, it plays better than the original. Not all that surprising. So so what do you think, Taylor? Neo versus Golf Story. Well, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think I'm going to convince you off of, off of Neo, and uh, I, I'll fight for Golf Story in some other categories, so we can eliminate that. So I, I, I'm fine with keeping uh, Neo and Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle as our runners-up for the Best Surprise Award. And again, just to recap, uh, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, PUBG, what a triumph. I mean, that game has been just caught fire this year. Uh, uh, just an incredible game that just got a, a, a lot of traction. I get the appeal. Uh, it's it's really something else. Just a game that started off as an Arma mod, believe it or not, spun off into its own game. And we've, we've seen this before, mods of other games turning into very full-fledged popular titles. For example, Dota 2, right? Starting off as a uh, World of, or excuse me, a Warcraft Three mod, really, really impressive stuff. Taking those elements, refining them, and, and building something completely fresh that really takes off, and that's something that I think we should definitely acknowledge and recognize, even if PUBG is still in early access, at least uh, on Xbox One. And again, we are recording this on December thirteenth. With, of course, the 1.0 update, the full release expected on PC later this month. I believe, like you said, it was December 20th. So I think we can still acknowledge it as a release. So congratulations to Player Unknown's Battlegrounds PUBG for winning our best surprise with close runners up Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle and Neo. All right, let's move on to our next category, best looking game slash visual style. This is a category that we uh, kind of have always an interesting conversation about. Uh, it's both a conversation about uh, graphically how impressive a game is, maybe performance wise, versus the art style of the game, which may have, uh, you know, some elements, maybe the UI looks really cool. Maybe the world that has been built around these games really looks awesome. It's not necessarily always about graphical fidelity, 1040, uh, you know, 1080, 4K, you know, it can also be, uh, you know, how the game was creatively designed to look like. Yeah, I would say it's less of a technical category and more of an artistic category for us. Right. What is visually appealing about the games in this category? So this list includes candidates such as Persona 5, Horizon Zero Dawn, The Legend of Zelda, Breath of the Wild, Four Last Things, For Honor, Splatoon 2, Sonic Mania, Nex Machina, Cuphead, Pyre, Super Mario Odyssey, Tekken 7, Star Wars Battlefront 2, and Wolfenstein 2, The New Colossus. All right, Taylor, I think there are some games on this list that you are going to fight for and I'm going to fight for, but I'm going to get this out of the way early. I think Persona 5 has to be on this list. Oh, agreed. Totally agree with that. Uh, Persona 5, it like that's probably that game's like entire appeal, right? The like <laughs> the visual style and and look of this game is so good that people literally cosplayed as the battle menu. Like <laughs> right. <laughs> that's that's insane. Yeah. That's insane. This game is just like it pops. It has a really cool comic book look. Uh it it's just yeah, it, very vibrant. It's incredible. It's incredible. It it surpasses what they did with Persona 4 and I didn't think that they could top that. It's 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 Visually, this game is stunning. I totally agree with that. I think Persona 5 deserves to be in this conversation. For me, Cuphead deserves to be in this conversation. So unique. Look at that art style. We've talked about it a bunch on the show before. You know, 1920s, 1930s uh, era of of cartoons, right? Disney cartoons. Very, very impressive stuff. And developed with hand-drawn animation. Each frame of animation was hand-drawn between the backgrounds and the sprites that you see on screen. Really, really phenomenal stuff. Something we haven't seen before. Really, really amazing, amazing art direction for Cuphead. I have to agree with you there. Cuphead is one of those games that uh, when they re- announced it and they showed the trailer for it, it was just like, oh my God, we haven't seen a game like this before. Like something that takes rips off of like 1920s cartoon style, Steamboat Willie, that kind of inspiration. You know, there I saw some think pieces that... Uh, said that Cuphead was kind of not so much a, a send up, uh, you know, some of that cartoon styling was a little problematic, a little bit racist, but Cuphead uh, basically goes with that art style and uh, does, does something really wild with it. 
and and makes the game it, it the game's graphical style really adds to the experience as opposed to detracts from it and i i think that l- just like persona 5 that that's that game's entire appeal yeah the, the, i'm i'm kind of struggling with having a third for here i think for such a big category it, it's fine to just identify the 3 and don't even bother with the rest but for the third one i i don't know i'm kind of torn i really like Sonic Mania because it was a really really great remix on classic Genesis graphics and uh it just really really pops it's a phenomenal phenomenal game. What would you uh, and what would you say is the best for me the the problem with Sonic Mania is that visually there's really only one zone that's all that interesting and that's uh the second zone uh Studioopolis or whatever. The rest yeah, of it no 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 you've got to play through the rest there are some excellent original zones in the rest of the game that I would I would argue are really really fantastic, like Press Garden, and there's the the one on the train in the desert that's phenomenal. Really really cool stuff in there. And like I'm not uh, I'm not I'm not debating that Sonic Mania is a cool send up of the like Genesis games and some of the level design really like harkens to that era. I'm just wondering if any of it is all that new. I mean that's fair. It's it's nothing entirely new. It's not as unique or innovative as some of these other games on this list. Yeah. I, I think maybe Breath of the Wild maybe could be a third on this list uh, that we can have the debate. Yeah, I think Breath of the Wild, like, the best part of that game, I think, is the world building and the the look of the shrines, the way there's this kind of, like, watercolor pastel approach of Zelda. Uh, my only problem that would detract from it is that, like, Zelda specifically has played in that space before, right? Uh, Twilight Princess, Wind Waker. Uh, what, Wind Waker is more cel shading, but more Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword. I would say play with the like watercolor painting like feel. For me, the the graphic, the graphical stylings of Breath of the Wild are playing off of Zelda tropes. And to be fair, they're doing them very, very well and very, very differently. Um, but there are, there are some things that like visually don't do as much for me okay Uh, so what would you have uh, besides persona 5 and cuphead uh, i think this conversation is uh probably down to pyre uh which has incredible art direction uh tekken 7 which is probably the one game i would put in terms of like graphical fidelity is like very very impressive for a tekken game and maybe Super Mario Odyssey. Again, and my problem was I like Super Mario Odyssey a, a whole lot. It's very high up on my list. But I don't know that Super Mario Odyssey is really doing anything different from a visual perspective. Uh, I think the 2D, the 2D parts, the 2D parts of the, the 3D worlds in Super Mario Odyssey are really, really cool. I think there's some really cool level, there's some cool level design in Super Mario Odyssey. It, it, visually very stunning. Uh, a graphical powerhouse on the Switch, absolutely. Uh, ho- totally holds the candle to Breath of the Wild, but uh, again, not doing anything all that new that I wouldn't expect to see, like uh, in Super Mario Sunshine or Mario sixty four or. Well, well see, th- this is where I would disagree with you because with Super Mario Odyssey, yes, it's it's you know cartoony, childlike level design and enemies, but they're phenomenal. I mean, I'm going to call out one specific example, which is toward the end, towards the end of the game. Bowser's Castle appearing as sort of like a like a samurai temple, right? Mm-hmm. In, in samurai era Japan is really really surprising and stunning and r- they it's very 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 polished. Uh and and the variety of the uh levels, the different kingdoms in that game are is really really impressive. I mean, you go everywhere from like New Donk City, right? You're next to humans and skyscrapers looks like new york and then you're on a beach and then you're on a a cliffside and then like i said bowser's castle is really incredible you're on spoiler okay here here's my spoiler alert because it's not a surprise you go to bowser's castle spoiler alert if you haven't played super mario odyssey towards the ending right you go to the moon you go to the moon that's incredible right (laughs) for super mario uh i i don't know it's it's really really I, i like it a lot but i would say it's best looking level design and character design i don't know if it's overall the best art direction or visual style i can i can see your argument for that because i think super mario odyssey like the two water levels in that game make the argument for why like it's the first time i've ever felt good playing a water level right i think the seaside kingdom is incredible looking it's probably one of my favorite levels in the in the entire game 
uh visually it's just stunning i think the like a kingdom with the cooking uh i forget the name of that with the vulcan oh yeah yeah, yeah. like I, I, yeah. like like visually it's very colorful and like really wild it looks like a like a kid's crayon drawing it's it's kind of awesome um I, for me, I think the two ones that we need to debate are whether we add Pyre or Super Mario Odyssey. So we've talked about Super Mario Odyssey. Let's talk a little bit about the visual stylings of Pyre. Pyre, for me, I think visually is probably Super Giant Games, the developer's best looking game visually. Uh, Pyre is, is like the culmination of what they tried to do in Bastion and what they tried to do with Transistor. And it's, it's them finally learning the lesson of like making the visual language a part, uh, like a cohesive part of the story, a cohesive part of the lore. Like, I think that game doesn't, it, you can debate me all you want about the gameplay or the story of that game, but visually, I think it's way up there in terms of like games that look really are like pleasant to look at. The entire like ten hour time span of, that you can take doing the single player campaign of that game is just very visually arresting. Like it's in, it's breathtaking how beautiful that game is. Yeah, I do have to acknowledge Pyre. It really is something else. I mean, beyond the sort of. Uh, characters uh and static images that you're seeing during dialogue which are beautifully drawn uh the the gameplay is so smooth and fluid in battle like it's really really impressive they play a lot with uh 3d elements in there it's really really phenomenal the uh specific arenas and worlds you visit are so unique and different each time you're always looking at something uh brand new and it's just really uh, unique, so I really, really, really like Pyre a lot. So I, I, I'm okay with adding it as the third between Persona Five, Cuphead, and Pyre, and and eliminating Super Mario Odyssey. I agree with that entirely. Uh, Pyre is probably the first time I've seen a game do like the stained glass effect, and it doing like it, it very well. It's it's oh yeah, it's really incredibly visually. You're you're talking about in the skill trees, right? Right. In the skill trees, it's right. just like, I've never seen skill trees look this good before. It's, it's incredible. I do want to give one more shout out because we're cutting it anyway. Star Wars Battlefront two. I think people are ignoring or overlooking how phenomenally polished Star Wars Battlefront two is. And just like Tekken seven, like you mentioned, technically it is an incredibly graph, like incredible graphics within that game. The multiplayer battles supporting, you know, 40 versus 40 or whatever it is. These huge scale battles is incredible. You you feel like you're in the movie. You 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 feel like you're playing these iconic battles, whether it's in space uh, in the Starfighter assault mode, or whether you're boots on the ground as a trooper. Like it's it's something else. It's 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 a really cohesive package. And for any Star Wars fan, this is the game to play. It's really really impressive uh, visually. I want to talk. Uh, do qu- three quick shout outs because we're eliminating them, and then I want to pick a winner. Uh, Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus probably is the game visually on this list that I would say probably has the most shocking visuals and images uh, considering the like source material and history that they're working with uh, it's incredible looking again technically performs I think very well I played the PC version uh, I the frame rate was very smooth for me uh, it, it has a lot of like visually like the moments in that game we'll talk about in another category but some really like stunning stuff uh oh, yeah it, yeah uh, it's it's uh, really don't spoil it yeah <laughs> it's really like for adult for some adult themes and images like uh really well done visually uh horizon zero dawn again uh technically very excellent uh graphics awesome uh the one thing the one knock against it is that uh like if you do some of the like skyrim mountain climbing that you can do in that game uh some of the textures don't look so great up close but that game's like photo mode is like one of the better photo modes out there and it like just looking at it it's beautiful it's a beautiful looking game just like star wars battlefront 2 uh graphic fidelity wise very 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 high quality especially for a uh, first party sony effort and uh, finally, the last game I want to shout out is uh, Next Machina. That game uh, it does an incredible job visually of making, uh, harkening back to like the Robotron, like 90s arcade, uh, Tron style uh, graphics that it's going after. It does that one thing very, very well. Uh, but against all these other games, I don't think it holds a candle. All right, so let's talk about the the, the winner between Persona 5, Cuphead, and Pyre. He's a really, really strong candidate, Taylor. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very torn. I would say the weakest of the three would have to be Pyre, unfortunately. I think it really is a, a, a debate between Cuphead and Persona 5 this year. 
Oh, boy. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to agree with you. Pyre is very strong, but it's, uh, boy, Persona, this has been an incredible year visually for games. And, um, I, man, Cuphead's. Which one are you leaning towards? Just give me your gut check right now. Uh, my gut check only because you see so much of it is Persona 5. Uh, the only thing is that's holding me back is that, uh, some of the environments in that game, like they've kind of done in persona games before like uh, tokyo is a place that they've been to in these games before hell is a place that they've been to in these games before the whole like you know persona design while slightly different in this game probably the best it's ever been uh, some familiar trends but i i like the way that game just pops visually it's just I, I can't like stop thinking about it. And it's more because you have to spend like 150 hours of that game on one playthrough. And it's just like every time you just like your mind, like I was playing it, my wife was watching it and she was just like, oh my God, this game is beautiful. Everything from the start menu to the battle menu to character portraits when you're talking with them in dialogue to the sort of dramatic sort of like screen tearing comic book style, like during intense moments of the characters like close ups of their eyes are, are so visually very neat very cool uh, very interesting to watch i will say if i have to make one knocks against because i i will say that cuphead also had the same thing of my wife look looking me playing as just like oh my god i've never seen a game look like this before uh, yeah it's something else i think the later parts of persona 5 uh visually are are less interesting than the like the first 100 hours or whatever some of the like designs of the the levels in persona 5 are really neat there's a level in the middle that is a like in- very interesting take on egypt and the pyramids um uh but i i think for me even though i'm leaning persona 5 i th- i think we have to give this to cuphead it does just some really incredible things uh that game is all is basically all style uh persona 5 it persona 5 is all style also but for cuphead it does just so much new stuff and it, it's a game that i kind of like i want to see more of Absolutely. Yeah, I, that is a game that I, I'm i very excited to see some DLC for. I really hope that they do. You know, I, 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 I have been leaning towards Cuphead for this category ever since we started writing down these nominations in this Google Doc. For Persona 5, it is awesome. I, I, I really like all the menu design and this, this comic book art style, but Cuphead just does so much unique, interesting things that we have never seen before in a in a very thoughtful way it's it's really great and unfortunately this is an audio only podcast and i wish and i hope that all the people who listen to this this show have played cuphead because it's a must play for this year if anything for the art style alone people will be frustrated with the difficulty i'm sure but wow 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 the 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 cartoon style that that 20s 30s era was was some of the best that cartoon has cartooning has ever seen and being able to relive that in a very 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 fun unique way is what separates cuphead from the rest in this category it's i i I would i would feel guilty not giving it the best looking game or visual style in this the art direction is wow 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 i can't say i'm at a loss for words of how great cuphead is it's like for for all the different bosses and worlds it's like visually very cohesive like you can like there's a through line that you like it makes sense to you it's just like Oh my god, I could be watching like Saturday morning cartoons in 1925. Visually, it totally makes sense. I, I, th- I agree with you. It has to win this category. So congratulations to Cuphead, the best looking game of this year with very close runners up, Persona 5 and Pyre. All right, Taylor, uh, let's move on quickly to our next category, biggest disappointment. This category is not worst game, even though it basically is worst game. These are <laughs> games that we had uh, great expectations for, and then for one reason or another, it let us down. These games on this list, I'm telling you, are are really, really bad. Yeah, I'm with you. Let me read through this list. Ukulele, Mass Effect Andromeda, Valkyria Revolution, Super Bomberman R, Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, For Honor, That's You, Disc Jam, Agents of Mayhem, Bubsy Return of the Woolies, Middle Earth Shadow of War, and Star Wars Battlefront 2. As you were reading those games, I was just thinking back on some of them. 
I'm getting chills about how bad some of these games are, Taylor. It's uh, it's terrible. <laughs> I want I want to hear your thoughts because I think for me, I there are some standouts. Okay, I, I have some standouts too. I think right now the conversation is between Mass Effect Andromeda, uh-huh. Marvel versus Capcom Infinite. Okay, and then the third is kind of a toss up uh, uh, for me. Uh, okay, all right. Uh, I don't know. I'd uh, maybe. Based on what you've you've told me about Valkyria Revolution, I would probably add that to the list. Yeah, I, I, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm like I'm like waiting to air my grievances about all of these games, but uh, uh, go for it. My, I, I I cannot wait to hear about my list. My list includes Mass, Mass Effect Andromeda, Valkyria Revolution, and the rest of it is just leaves such a bad taste in my mouth that I can't. Like I didn't play. Mo- it's not worth the conversation. It's not worth it. It's not even like worth farting about. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like like Bubsy is just like why did we bring that back? I uh, yeah. I don't understand. Agents of Mayhem, I'm like shocked that a I'm not that shocked that the Saints Row series hasn't been like as stellar as like Saints Row the Third. Uh, it's just but for me the disappointing thing about that game is the humor. Otherwise, it's a pretty like average game. It's not it does not do anything exciting, but it's also like not the worst. Uh, Shadow of War, same same type of deal. Disappointing follow up to Shadow of Mordor. Way too long. The last chapter of it is very grindy, but an average open world game. Uh, Battlefront Two is probably on this list because of loot box and the progression. I haven't played this game. That's the only reason I added to it. Yeah, because I, I I've played through that game and that's that's the reason why it's on there. Yeah, the rest of these games I like. I don't even want to waste my breath with. Like some people might like them, some people might not. Like Ukulele is a disappointing. Uh, like Banjo Kazooie, like, but like character action platformers have been on the decline for a long time now, and I I think the more disappointing thing about Ukulele is that like some of the Banjo Kazooie developers didn't make a good Banjo Kazooie game, but that's fine. Like those games are generally for kids, and I uh, like it's kind of whatever. Uh, yeah, Super Bomberman R, like. It's an average Bomberman game. Yes. Like, in fact, Konami seems to be like supporting it more and more these days. And it seems to be picking up some steam way after its initial release. So that might someday be a good game. It's because of the local uh, multiplayer is what still makes that game relevant. I have Super Bomberman R and I have to tell you the single player stuff is awful. It's really, really, really bad. It's just not worth playing through. It is just like classic Bomberman games. You only want to play the multiplayer. Okay, but that's always what Bomberman has been about, right? Right. Okay. Right. So, <laughs> I I haven't played Marvel's Capcom Infinite. I I need to hear the case about why that was very disappointing. Wow. Okay. So I rented this game because I had some reservations about that. Everyone has criticized the character models, especially with Chun Li's facial animations, which admittedly are very very bad. This game across the board, it just feels like it needed a delay to polish it. It was. It's just a mess. Everything about Marvel vs. Capcom, when you think about it, the overall style and presentation of it has been excellent throughout the series. With this is the exception. It is so flat and lifeless. The character select screen is just like static images. The announcers are it, 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 the announcers really boring. The story is incredibly cheesy and phoned in. The voice acting is terrible. Across the board, all the the character models are just bad. Some of them feel directly ripped from Marvel vs. Capcom 3, minus the cell shading part. It just feels so unoriginal. And and the movesets are like practically identical, which I get, you know, you do want to have players are gonna want to play some of the characters they're accustomed to and and have them play similarly, but it's just to the extreme to the point where there's just nothing, absolutely nothing new about them whatsoever. Even the the first impression you get, the start menu. Again, think about Marvel vs. Capcom 1, 2, 3, and how awesome and unique those uh the the music was and the menus were, right? That that, that really is a great those are great features about this fighting game. Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite lacks all of that. It's just so lifeless and boring. It's so static. I wish we could we could show off some screenshots right now. It's just so 
I, I, I just can't get over how disappointing this game was. Never mind the style part, but the gameplay is just really, really flat. Don't even bother playing through the story mode. It's not worth it. I mean, for me, like, I just read a story today about Marvel's Capcom Infinite. Like, they're planning Evos for next year. And, like, that game is so disappointing that, like, even tournament organizers don't even want to have it on the main stage, right? Like, that's embarrassing for Capcom, right? Like, very. Like, they went ahead and rene- like, Street Fighter V didn't set the world on fire. So, like, they're like reneging on their thing saying like oh there's only going to be one edition of street fighter 5 uh they're re redu- they're doing an arcade edition so they're going to try to fix the street fighter 5 problem but like marvel's capcom infinite they're just like not that long after the game's release they're already doing free game trials to try to increase that game's player base that's pretty bad uh, i haven't played it but from what you've told me about it i don't even want to touch it with a 10 foot pole yeah and the roster isn't as large as the past games either that's a that's a disappointing part too. All you really need to say about how disappointing that game is is you just need to look at the character select screen and figure out that it's very asymmetrical on one team side on the Capcom side and see how many more Marvel characters there are because Marvel is trying to push their movies these days. Yes. And yes. the yes. where they license their properties in other things like video games is just an afterthought. And, and if you play through the story, the the the, the story campaign, it is so phoned in where it's just a Marvel storyline with Capcom characters randomly slapped into it, which makes absolutely no sense. I mean, even for a fantasy crossover game, it's really pathetic. The story is just pathetic. All right. I think it has to be on this list. I don't think it's the most disappointing. And I'm stretching. This is not a video podcast, but I'm stretching because I want to save my deepest hatred for these other two games. (laughs) Okay. So Mass Effect Andromeda. I reviewed this game. This game is 90 hours long. The fourth Mass Effect game, follow up to a very, say what you will about Mass Effect 3, very popular trilogy. One of BioWare's probably flagship franchises. And they say they're going to release Mass Effect 4. Everybody's very excited. And then we get to Mass Effect Andromeda. Uh, no Shepard. Okay, fine. We can do something new, new universe, new aliens. New story beats. Okay, that could be good. You know, other sci-fi series have done that before. Bioware has done these kinds of games before. We can trust Bioware, right? Then Mass Effect Andromeda comes, and it's just a complete turd. The <laughs> On top of being a complete turd, visually, that game came out, the game preview, I think the Xbox One version was the first thing to come out of that. And that game, <laughs> visually, it was so messed up faces were messed up like the kinds of like game breaking bugs you would see in like assassin's creed games typically just uh, things didn't look right they had to patch it two weeks in okay fine the introduction the introductory level world of that game is really not a good introduction to any video game ever it's this very father meets son type of thing very stereotypical story beats okay fine Bad first five hours. Doesn't leave a very strong impression. And then the rest of the game is just this very flat, not very exciting... Yeah, it sounds like a a floundering space odyssey, doesn't it? It does. Because I haven't played through the whole thing yet. And it's just... It's such a colossal waste of time. Like... It's almost Dragon Age 2. It, it's Actually, it's worse than Dragon Age 2. It A lot of these side quests that are supposed to be... That lead you on to think that there might be going somewhere interesting... Don't end up going anywhere interesting at all. It's a lot of this like colonialism narrative that's just like really bad. In fact, the only thing good about Mass Effect Andromeda maybe is its combat, which is kind of janky. Like it gives you the most freedom to create all these character classes and mobility, like and anywhere cover. That should be that sounds really awesome on paper. Some really new interesting powers, and then just gameplay wise, it just completely falls on its face. The battles aren't that interesting. Uh, the cover system doesn't work all that well. It's 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 all just kind of like this like mush. And I I like I can't believe I spent committed ninety hours to this game. I just like it's so disappointing that. <laughs> EA, one of the bad boys of video game publishers, basically canceled their DLC plans <laughs> because yeah, the game based on the feedback. <laughs> based on the feedback, like it, it was that horrendous, that tr- that much of trash, and the price drop just plummeted. I mean, that's one of these full full price AAA games that you you see where the value lasts quite a bit of time. Mass Effect games as a franchise have been incredibly tremendously popular and. 
just a just a boon for for EA. With this exception, very disappointing. I picked it up under ten dollars, right? Brand new, right? And that, and that's within one year. And when you and when like the story started coming out about that game's development being a hot mess, the end result of all that hot mess development was a game that turned out to be surprise a hot mess. Yeah. So and never mind the multiplayer. The multiplayer is super janky. I I tried that out. Oh man, what have they done? Mass Effect Three. They nailed it. You know, say what you will about the loot boxes in that game, but they they did some incredible stuff with the classes in in the multiplayer. But I experienced so much jank and, and network issues that weren't specific to me in that game. Really, really disappointing. Uh, horde mode style of gameplay with with uh, Andromeda. Just what a bummer. In terms of expectation, I probably had the most hope for Mass Effect Andromeda, and then it let me the most down probably this year. Yeah, but but I have to save. The game that I could not bear, I could bear to finish Mass Effect Andromeda. I could not bear to get past hour three of Valkyria Revolution. Oof, that game. Okay. So Valkyria Chronicles, let's call it a cult classic. Uh, pretty good game. Tactics, RPG, very fun take, cool visual style, tactics game, uh, with some action elements, uh, followed up by a, is somewhat similar style PSP game in, in Valkyria Chronicles 2. Again, s- similar kind of vibe. A little bit more disappointing compared to the original Valkyria Chronicles, but that's okay. That's okay. They'll eventually make good on the promise. Then uh, Sega decides to release a J- Japan-only uh, third game. Okay, fine. So for the US, they say, okay, right, we're going to finally give Valkyria Chronicles fans this cult classic like, we're going to give them a new game, Valkyrie Revolution. It's going to be awesome. And then what they turn in is this uh, not tactics-based really at all, very lame third-person action game that just controls terribly. The characters are all these, like, the worst JRPG tropes. The I, I can't even stand to look at the, the f- main character that you play as. He's just a piece of garbage uh, it, like <laughs> describe the gameplay a little bit because i'm not familiar with with valkyrie revolution it's definitely different from the tactics rpg uh uh gameplay of valkyrie chronicles one and two right so on its face it's a it's a game where you control a squad of four um there are different character classes uh the the main protagonist is like a sword class the other is a third person action right? third person action correct and uh is it like dynasty warriors it's it's di- it's like dynasty warriors but if you made dynasty warriors uh like as slow as molasses and the <laughs> ai as like dumber than the like easiest mode on dynasty warriors it's just it's bad the only good the only redeeming part of valkyrie revolution is the music but everything else like i taylor i can i can finish i can stomach a bad game i finished mighty number no. nine last year i couldn't i, I couldn't <laughs> yep, bear that was our winner i couldn't bear to play any more valkyrie revolution like i bought that game i pre-ordered it i was very excited and i popped it in and it was just i couldn't do it the worst i couldn't i couldn't do it man <laughs> and that game is it's horrendous and the only the only thing that like makes me hopeful is that sega announced this year that they're going to do valkyria chronicles 4 it's going to be more like the original valkyria chronicles and we're going to forget that valkyria revolution even really happened uh woof woof it, it was bad here's my pushback about that is because this is the biggest disappointment category and i don't know if i had personally high expectations for valkyria revolution even though i've played the rest of the franchise I don't know if it's bigger than Mass Effect Andromeda or Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, given the expectations of the franchise up until this point. Uh, so okay, all right. I I think we have a winner. I think it has to be Mass Effect Andromeda. I agree with you. Yeah, I, I think sure. both. I think both games have poisoned the well for future games. But Mass Effect Andromeda has so poisoned the well that even the companies behind ma- who who made Mass Effect are like, ooh, we might have to like start this universe over from scratch. Yeah, retcon it completely, I agree. Like, we built this... Yeah. We, like, we might have to bring back Shepard. Like, yeah. that's how that's how bad Andromeda... Like, I feel bad that Valkyrie Revolution came out and it was just, like, a piece of crap. But if we're talking about the game that more people probably bought and played and were disappointed in, it's, it's Andromeda by a country mile. Like, yeah. Valkyrie yeah. Revolution, it, like, yeah, it's a bad game, but... 
thankfully, not that many people are going to be exposed to the pandemic. Mass Effect, and, and that's why that, that's why I'm pushing back on that is because not as many people are going to be exposed to Revolution, Valkyrie Revolution, with with Marvel versus Capcom Infinite. I would say as a close second, personally, I had to return that game when I rented it the the day I got it. I was like, wow, this is not fun at all. And I'm a huge Marvel versus Capcom fan. It was one of the few fighting games I actually keep up with uh, because I'm not particularly good at them, but just so bad even if you're just a marvel fan yeah <laughs> it's just well ugh. and i think the ugly i think the worst part uh, again not to harp on andromeda but is it strings you along it like it tells it like always gives you like that one little nugget that's like oh this could be interesting okay yeah oh uh, no not that interesting all right next yeah, quest and then you, <laughs> and then you push through and then it you, yeah. you push through it and then by the end of the game you're just like where did where did that was it? where did 85 <laughs> hours of my life go i'm not gonna get that back why yeah why oh, so yeah. all right uh, biggest disappointment of 2017, Country Mile, Mass Effect Andromeda with worst runners up, uh, Valkyria <laughs> Revolution and Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. Let's, let's move on from this category, Taylor. Yeah. Next, we're going to go back to, uh, an honor, not a dubious one. Uh, best mobile or handheld game. We are celebrating these specifically by this platform because we feel like these are lighter experiences than what you will play on console or PC. So we have to acknowledge them as being uh, somewhat unique. I, I also I also want to say that uh, with the advent of the Switch coming out, we may have to think consider rejiggering this category because technically uh, the Switch is a handhold handheld uh, console. But uh, what we're talking about here for this for this year are games that appeared on phones or the 3DS. Uh, or the Vita, the Switch may enter, Switch games may enter into this conversation next year, but we just felt that like it was kind of unfair to, uh, put those mobile games up against games that come out on the Switch. It's just, you know, the Switch is a more fully featured console experience. I would agree with you. And that's why, uh, these nominees, none of them are Switch games, uh, starting with this year. So we'll have to revisit this category starting with next year to maybe rename it or redefine it or eliminate it altogether. But here we go for this year. Best mobile handheld game. We have Monument Valley 2, Fire Emblem Heroes, Dynasty Warriors Unleashed, Layton's Mystery Journey, Catriel and the Millionaire's Conspiracy, OK Golf, Metroid, Samus Returns, Animal Crossing Pocket Camp, Million Onion Hotel, Puzzle Fighter, HQ Trivia, and Reigns, Her Majesty. Okay. I've only played a few games on this list. Uh, for me, uh, not that strong of a year on this area, in this arena. Uh, I feel the same way, yeah. I, kind of a weak category. The games that I played, Fire Emblem Heroes, uh, you know, a gotcha game with Fire Emblem mechanics. Uh, sort of interesting take on that franchise. Uh, lost a little bit of its steam and legs. I think some people are still playing that game. Uh, not a lot of staying power with that, so I, I'm okay with taking that off. Uh, Dynasty Warriors Unleashed. Interesting that they took the Dynasty Warriors formula and made it a good controlling Dynasty Warriors game. Again, a lot of gotcha-style mechanics, stamina timers. Uh, I've seen that done better elsewhere, and uh, frankly, I don't I think it was like me and the rest of Japan that played that game and Korea. <laughs> and I like there are better Dynasty Warriors experiences, even on mobile. So I'm going to go yeah. ahead and eliminate that. Uh, I've played Puzzle Fighter. I do think Puzzle Fighter is a strong contender because it's probably the game on this list that uh, is probably most accurate to the source material, plays very well. I haven't encountered that much lag. Uh, my only complaint against it is uh, some of the... The, some of the balance in that game is kind of weird. It has this uh, Clash of Clans style progression mechanic with cards and leveling up characters. And some of the characters in that game, uh, like Jill, is just way ba- out of balance. And it's mostly a PvP multiplayer game. There's not really a whole lot of single player content. So that's my only knock against it. Yeah, you know, as a free to play game, there's daily challenges in there. So you get the you know the extra loot drops right the the extra cards to or new characters to upgrade with and depending on the character you're playing with give you new attack patterns uh and and for those of you who are unfamiliar with puzzle fighter it's a a drop style game sort of like match 3 not quite but it's uh yeah it's it's fun and it's been around for a while but 
I think optimized for mobile. It's very, very well done. Very impressed with it so far. I haven't played a ton of the PvP online. I had a bit of server issues during the first week, but I still think it's a very, very solid game. Call it a port, I guess. But, I mean, they have these chibi-style games, and I don't think the free-to-play stuff in that game really get in the way, personally. I still think they give you a ton of uh, drops, a ton of opportunities to enjoy the game without having to 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 dump uh, a lot of money into it. Would you agree with that? I agree with that. I, again, I think we can. I can safely and eliminate it because it's not new. Oh, you're gonna eliminate it? I was gonna keep it. I I don't, I, I kind of want to eliminate it only because it's not new. It's it, really only interesting to people who really like Puzzle Fighter. I do. Okay. I do think if this game succeeds, I would be interested in a more fully featured uh, Puzzle Fighter product. And uh, maybe Capcom is building the case for this franchise to return. Uh, I hope that if they do something like that, it turns out to be a five dollar uh, phone game as opposed to a free to play thing with a lot of these timers and stuff that kind of, uh, while not that intrusive, uh, detract a little bit from the experience. Um, f- for that reason, I also want to eliminate Animal Crossing Pocket Camp. I think. Oh, I don't even know why it's on this cat. Who nominated this? Did I put this or you put this? I, I might oh man, put, this should be on uh, yeah. biggest disappointment. Yeah, I. <laughs> I for Animal Crossing fans, it's a huge disappointment. You already don't like Animal Crossing, but no. this is like, in terms of Animal Crossing releases, it's like down there below Happy Home Designer. Uh, the, uh, like, getting new furniture in that game is all based on a timer. The, like, free-to-play mechanics for, like, a Nintendo product are really, like, grossest, grossest it's ever been. They really try to pull your harsh strings with uh, K.K. Slider and Tom Nook, the two best characters uh, it, it's, it's, and it's not good. Yeah. Locking them behind paywalls. Yeah. Locking them behind paywalls. And there's like way too many loading screens for an animal crossing game. Like gross. I, I yeah, I, I, I wish that they would make, they probably will. Uh, they're holding out to make a like fully featured animal crossing game on the switch, but pocket camp is not going to be it. So, yeah, all right. Agreed. I, I want to hear, we've talked negatively about some of these games. I want to hear what you would put in the candidate pool here. All right. Have you played Million Onion Hotel? I uh, I saw the footage and it looks like a wacky Japanese game, and I am totally on board for wacky Japanese <laughs> it, games. It is. It's the wackiest of Japanese games. Think of it like a. Uh, it's like a Connect Four, although I think it's a five by five grid. It's like Connect Four blended with Whack a Mole with boss battles, but the style of that game is just so ridiculous. <laughs> You know, that there's the, there's just very bizarre music and sound effects. It's almost like a rhythm game to some effect as you're tapping away enemies, uh, to, to clear the board. Very fun. I was watching the YouTube video of that and I, it's hard to decipher what the game exactly is. Describe the gameplay. Is it, it's a rhythm puzzle game? Okay. So it's, like I said, it, it it's, it's like Connect Four and Whack a Mole put together. So what happens is you see this five by five grid. And every so often on the on the grid, you'll see enemies pop up, and you have to tap them away to de- to defeat them. And as you tap away, as you defeat them on a particular square on the grid, that square lights up. And when you start forming rows, uh, you know when you start making combos of rows diagonally, horizontally, or vertically, you gain extra points. But what makes this game challenging is as you get further. Uh, new enemies start to ta- uh, pop up that have different movement mechanics where it's not on only on one grid. They're like moving across the screen. Depending on where you defeat them, they will only highlight certain spots on the grid. So it's di- more difficult for you to clear the board as you're trying to highlight specific squares to, again, to form the line either horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. And then interspersed between dealing with the mayhem of tapping away enemies on screen, there are random boss battles that are very, very challenging. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just so weird. And in between, like there are these sort of breaks, story breaks in between that are very bizarre. It tries to tell the story of like a mafia guy in a hotel that is trying to be, is, is about to be assassinated. And it's just so strange. The music is strange. It's very bizarre, but it's very, very fun, lighthearted. One of these mobile games that doesn't take a ton of time. You can play, you know, in five minute spurts. And I, I highly recommend it if you haven't checked it out. Million Onion Hotel. I believe it's, I, I play it on Android. I believe it's also available on iOS. You gotta, you gotta play it. Would, would it be, would it be fair to say it's the, uh, child of, uh, Katamari plus like 10 million? 
Uh, 10 million, well, I, I mean, it's neither of those in terms of gameplay, but in terms of what you're thinking of, like, style-wise, I would say yes. Like, it, like, like influence-wise, I'm, I'm thinking. In, influence, yeah, I, I could see those, yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, but I, I, I think it deserves, just because I think by default, the rest of this category is kind of weak, I would like to see it, maybe not win, but it be it as a runner-up. For me, I would also see like to see the other two being for me i think the runaway winner in this category unfortunately it's not a mobile game and i think this kind of gives it a bit of an unfair advantage this is a 3ds game and that's metroid uh samus returns it's really really uh an incredible remake of uh samus 2 originally on game boy on handhelds we've been waiting for a very very solid metroid game for a while now a lot of spinoffs lately it's just solid all around. If you like Metroid, you're going to love this game. It's one of the best in the series. Well, what's surprising is that the developer of Mercury Steam made a pretty awful Castlevania Lords of Shadow sequel that was on the 3DS that didn't control well, graphically looked terrible, the frame rate was kind of crappy. And then they Nintendo announced that they were developing this Mat- Metroid Samus Returns, you know, Metroid 2, probably one of the most overlooked Metroid games. And you're like, ooh, I don't know about that. For me, it's very encouraging to hear that it's one of the going to turn out to be one of the better games in the metroid pantheon yeah and and for me i would say maybe the third one for me just because of how unique and innovative it is would be hq trivia which is a live fmv game (laughs) i i I feel kind of weird about hq trivia because it's in terms of gameplay it's it's a trivia game the 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 thing it's doing is it's the same thing that one versus 100 did with a live host uh uh, when I ever have, I've tried to play HQ Trivia, like he doesn't look that great. There's been a lot of like streaming issues, a lot of, and I feel kind of weird. It's like a gambling app, and I don't know where this money is coming from. It's like by the guys who brought us Vine, and uh, like it's just screaming to be regulated. Like this is wild. People are winning like hundreds of dollars and being paid through the shady PayPal thing. And I just the, the whole thing. And then there was that story that came out about the guys paying the money are kind of holding the host in hostage the host can't really say anything it's this weird uh, that was th- that whole thing was yeah there seems to be internal problems i think it was a profile in of, of the ceo uh in the huffington post but i don't think that detracts from from what the game is like i mean you're playing what is it is it it's 12 questions right uh, 10 or 12 i don't i don't remember but it's yeah, but- it, it, it's like goes by rounds and then you get more and more people get eliminated as they get the questions wrong eventually when they you know get to a smaller pool it, there's like you know whatever the cash prize is if there are eight players left then you know let's say the cash prize is $1000 that $1000 gets split between the eight people who won the last round Th- there's no buy in either you're not spending money to to gamble inside right it's just no questions asked. You win the money if you complete all these uh, trivia questions. Correct. In terms of like mobile games that really like captured America's attention, uh, HQ Trivia probably deserves to be on this list. But gameplay wise, I'm not. I'm not so sure. But I don't really. All right. All right. I don't, fair enough. But I don't have a strong relationship with all, any of these other games. Reigns Her Majesty, I think, has to be, go off. Although probably a good expansion to Reigns, which came out last year is an expansion, right? It's not like a t- completely new concept. So the writing in, in Reigns Her Majesty probably is very good. Yeah, it's not an expansion in the sense that you need Reigns 1 in order to play Reigns Her Man- Majesty the sequel. It is a standalone title. There are very few uh, new gameplay stuff uh, added to it. It's just very solid, witty, clever writing, and I think everyone should play it. Think like tinder grinder whatever whatever dating app you use swipe left swipe right to make decisions and it's more of like a choose your own adventure style game uh, very 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 fun and entertaining but yeah I'm, I'm okay with with eliminating it okay hk trivia i'm i'm convinced i agree with you uh it's a little little janky but the rest of these you know i don't feel strongly about either i i, I will say my piece about the latent game which is the longest title ever latent's mystery journey catriel and the millionaire's conspiracy and it started off as a uh an ARG, right? An alternate reality game. Is that right? Alternate reality game? Mm-hmm. That's what that stands uh, for. Yeah. Well, it, it started off as like these puzzles that you're meant to solve in real life. And there was this website dedicated to it so you can unlock extra things in this game, whether you're playing it on on the 3DS or on mobile. It was kind of weird and boring, I thought. Playing this game, unfortunately, is a bit expensive. I think it retailed when it was released on mobile. It was 15 bucks. And then the exact same title ported over to 3DS. 
I think it was at a full 30 or 40. Ooh. And I didn't quite understand why. It's it's probably my least favorite latent game out there. It's still a solid puzzle game, right? You're still solving logic-based puzzles. You get some hints here and there. Uh, if you're if you're into that sort of stuff, uh, you know, brain teasers and puzzles, it's very fun. But I would say it's the weakest of the series, so I don't I don't feel comfortable uh, winning it this year as our best mobile or handheld game. But the other two, I'm, I I don't feel that great about either. Okay, golf. It's just a very relaxing, minimalistic golf game. Very simple touch flick controls. That's all it is. And you know, it's sort of this. Uh, it's not vectorized graphics, but it's very minimalistic, right? Very simple. But but Monument it, Valley Two. Go ahead. I Ray. was just going to ask: Is it doing the same thing? Like Desert Golf was kind of phenomenon last year. Is it doing the same thing as Desert Golf? Basically, yes. Desert Golf is just simple two D, uh, flat landscapes, pretty much scrolling left to right. This is in portrait style, um, but it's it's more of a isometric view. That's what I meant to say. That's what this is. That's the only real difference. Okay, I've never very similar game. I've never even heard of this game. Visually, it kind of looks like Hitman Go, which is a compliment, honestly. Right. Uh, right. But if you're if you you're a big golf game fan, and if you're saying it's not that good, I I think we can eliminate it. Uh, yep. Okay, so I didn't play Monument Valley two, and a small confession, I didn't actually play Monument Valley one. However, mm-hmm. I recognize that Monument Valley is probably. Uh, in the pantheon of mobile games that have influenced video games forever, uh, Monument Valley is is high up there. I've seen people who don't play video games talk about the original Monument Valley. Is it's basically doing the same thing, correct? It just adds some new levels, and it, it was kind of a surprise out of left field when they dropped it. Uh, pricing was very favorable, I would say. Uh, probably an okay sequel. It is, it is, and and again, similar to the conversation with with Reigns. You know, not that much different. Still gorgeous. Still really fun puzzle game. Very interesting visual elements. Think, think of MC Escher's paintings uh, come to life in a, in a video game, and and it's really really something else. It's credible. Highly recommend it. I think both of these games, Monument Valley One and Two, deserve to be in like all time great mobile games. However, again, with the caveat that it doesn't do that much different than the first one. Okay. So I think by default, <laughs> you know, we've eliminated the rest of the nominees here, right? We just went through the rest. Right now we're left with Monument Valley 2, Metroid Samus Returns, and Million Onion Hotel. I think Metroid is the runaway winner. We haven't talked much about it, though, but put it this way. Play Metroid 2 on Game Boy. Compare it to this game. Tell me which one you like better, all right? It's really, really solid, really, really fun Metroid gameplay. It's, it's, it's really incredible. Music's great. Plays very tightly. You know, with the 3DS at the end of its life, replaced by the Switch, we're not anticipating or expecting many more 3DS games out there. This is one of the essentials. This is one of the late, late, late games they've released that's still worthwhile, still worth beating, still worth playing through, especially if you're a Metroid fan. Gotta play it. Yeah, for me, with the question with Metroid games, is is it better or equivalent to Super Metroid? Probably the standout game from that franchise. And if you're telling me that Metroid Samus Returns is probably one of the better games on the three in the 3ds library like i'm very excited to check that out at some point it, it sounds very exciting so just to recap our winners from this category clear runaway winner for best mobile handheld game this year metroid samus returns followed by runners up monument valley 2 and M- million onion hotel uh based on this conversation i think we need to revisit this category next year <laughs> all right and that's all the time we have today for this episode of our game of the year deliberations just to wrap up the candidates that we've chosen and categories best surprise winner player unknown's battlegrounds with runners up mario and rabbit's kingdom battle and neo in best looking game slash visual style winner is cuphead with close runners up persona 5 and pyre in the category of biggest disappointment Mass Effect Andromeda is the biggest, most disappointing game this year, followed by Worst Runners Up, Valkyria Revolution, and Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite. And finally, our last category for this episode, Best Mobile and Handheld Game, Metroid Samus Returns, Runaway Winner, followed by Runners Up, Monument Valley 2, and Million Onion Hotel. We have just five more categories to go, which we will talk about on our next episode. Right. The remaining ones are Best New Character, Best Gameplay Moment, Best Music, Biggest Most Important News Story, and Worst Trend. And of course, with our third episode for our Game of the Year deliberations, we will have our final top 10 Editor's Choice Awards, followed by our consensus overall game of the year for 
2017. So stay tuned for that. Our next two episodes. We just want to wrap up this show by saying that a written wrap up of the award so far is available at the link in the show notes. So check that out. If you like this episode, head over to Apple Podcasts and Stitcher to subscribe. And please, please rate and review our show. It would be a huge help. You can also subscribe to our show on Google Play Music, TuneIn, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. Or you can like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash 1PVS2P. Watch us on Twitch and follow us on Twitter where we're very active. That account is at 1PVS2P. For more video game news, reviews, history, culture, and music, check out our site, 1PVS2P.com. As always, we want to thank Benedict Hero for letting us play his music for our show, Coffee Stomp and Super Manly Brothers X. Both songs are part of the compilation project, Chip Tunes Equals Win. I'm Taylor Ray. That's my co-host, Ryan Ray. Stay tuned for the rest of our Game of the Year deliberations of 2017. Have you played Million Onion Hotel? I uh, I saw the footage, and it looks like a wacky Japanese game, and I am totally on board for wacky Japanese <laughs> it, games. It is.